My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Friday, August 5th, 2016. I'm in Venita, Oklahoma, interviewing Tony Norton Stanley as part of our Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project with a focus on the Glass House Restaurant. Tony, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for asking. Well, let's learn a little bit more about you. Could you tell me the year you were born and where you were born? I was born in Venita, Oklahoma, at the Venita Hospital on July 26, 1949. Okay. And tell me a little bit about your parents. My parents were both from Venita. My mother, Wanda Randall Norton, and my dad, Pete Norton. His next name is really Rex Eugene, but he went by Pete growing up. They both went to school in Venita. Uh, mother went to Venita High School. Well, actually, she went a little bit to Sacred Heart also, but she mainly went to Venita Public Schools. And Daddy uh, went to um, Sacred Heart Academy. And so he, um, but they were both you know, from Venita. Mother uh, was um, the daughter of business people here in Venita, Jess and Ellen Randall, my grandparents had a tire shop, and so she grew up in the business world, and my dad was a jockey to begin with when he was a young man. Uh, he lived with his aunt and uncle, grew up there, and um, then he went on to OSU, which was Oklahoma A&M, but he only went to school there for, I think, one year, and then came back, and he went into business with my grandparents and they had the Randall Norton Tire Company and then my grandparents retired and their daddy kept the business and um, stayed there until they sold it in, uh, I'm going to say in the early 80s, I think sometime. I grew up in the business also working with them and my mother's best friend was Annabelle Sutter and um, so I knew a lot about, about the glass house and as a child I always wanted to was fantastic because we didn't have any escalators in Venita and you could go up the escalator <laughs> to go to <laughs> the glass house and my mother and Annabelle were in a sorority together Epsilon Sigma Alpha sorority and they would have a lot of meetings at the glass house and as an only child on a Sunday afternoon when they'd have a meeting sometimes they mother would ask me to come with her you know just to get out of the house and so I would go up and down the escalator and roam the halls of the glass house and do that sort of thing. I um, was always active in a lot of different activities in Benita, um, as were my parents, and um, so we're, we're Venetians. <laughs> so tell me about the, the schools you attended growing up. Hall Hustle Elementary, which is um, on the north side of Venita, I went there <clears throat> Excuse me, from my first grade to fourth grade, and then we moved to the country um, whenever I was actually in the second grade, but my grandparents um, became my legal guardian so I could stay in school in, the, in, in town. Then my fifth and sixth grade year, mother decided that it was okay if I went out to Ironside School, so I went out there my fifth and sixth grade. And um, while it was a really good experience, it didn't really prepare me much for the upper grades in junior high and high school, so when I came back to school in the seventh grade at Venita Junior High, I was a little bit behind, but I, you know, I caught up and, and it was okay. And then I went to high school in Venita and graduated in the class of 1967. We'll celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. And um, I was a twirler um, in the band, um, did a lot of activities. I was a candy striper, I was in rainbows, um, did a lot of things like that. So. And after high school, what happened? What did you do? Okay, after high school I went to college. I went to OSU for, I only went there for one semester. And then I came back to Venita and went to Oklahoma, uh, Northeast Oklahoma a and in Miami, uh, finished my freshman year there, got married, had children, um, went to uh, cosmetology school in, I'm going to say, 75, maybe four, four, three, four, somewhere along there. And uh, worked as, uh, had my own beauty shop then for a couple or three years, and then I decided that wasn't for me, and I wanted to go back to school, thought I wanted to be a teacher. A music teacher so went back to college and um, at that time I went I finished at NEO and then I went to the University of Tulsa graduated and got my degree in music education and became a high school band director and taught school um, in Ketchum and then ultimately in Benita and did most of my teaching there went from teaching music to teaching um, marketing uh, business uh, business education and um, retired from Benita schools about 12 years ago I guess and then 
bought a travel agency, and since then I've been a travel agent. So, a little bit of everything, right? Okay. Uh, what year did you graduate from TU? Oh, geez, 1978, I want to say. Okay. And and what year did you retire from teaching? <laughs> 20, how old am I? 67. It would have been 10 years ago. It is what? This is 16. It would have been 06, 05. Okay. Well, let's get back to the glass house. Sure. And so, you know, you would have been a little girl, but do you recall them putting in the turnpike? Oh, yes. I remember it very well. We lived not too far from where the turnpike went by um, Veneta um, from, you know, northeast to southwest. And so I remember we used to drive the turnpike before it was open, and that was a common thing for people to do um, because uh, I don't know why. I mean, I was a kid, so I don't remember why, but I just remember that we would get on the turnpike and drive to Tulsa. Now, we didn't do much going to Joplin. We'd go to Joplin. I went to Joplin a lot. My great-grandmother lived up there. But um, I don't remember driving the turnpike so much, but we did drive the turnpike a lot going to Tulsa and back and forth. And um, I remember them building the turnpike Yes, very much. That was a, that was a big, big deal in, in Veneta back in those days. And lots of people worked on the turnpike and because, you know, it was such a huge undertaking. Um, we had a lot of people who, who worked there mm -hmm. when they were building it. And so when you saw this structure, this arch structure going up, you know, what, what are some of your early memories? How in the world is this thing going to stand up? You know, because it's crossing a highway, a four-lane highway. How is it going to? How is it going to stay up there without falling down in the middle? Of course, I was a kid then, so I didn't really understand, you know, things like that. <clears throat> but it was it was fascinating as a child. It was a very fascinating structure, and the thought that it was going to be over the highway and it was going to have several restaurants and gift shop and all kinds of things. Um, it, it just we were all just in awe, you know, as kids especially. Mm -hmm. And I can remember when we were a little older, 12 or 14, I guess, maybe about 12 years old, when it, or 10, something like that, when it opened. I don't remember the year it opened, but I do remember going there and thinking that it was the most fantastic place I've ever seen. And I have been a lot of places and traveled. My parents were quite, quite the travelers, and, and, and I traveled a lot when I was a kid. But, but to live in a place that would have something like that, it was just so what I want you kind of to do for me is describe the old building mm -hmm. back in the day. So when I walk in, what do I see? Well, when you walked in, well, first we always parked outside, you know, because we didn't get on the turnpike to drive to Glasshouse. We would get, we would, we would pull up from over the bridge or over the the viaduct, over the top of the turnpike from the. Um, north going south and then turn in there, turn back west and park outside and we would walk across the, the driveway which was where the um, Phillips, or no, I'm sorry, Conoco, Conoco stations were, um, whichever direction we were going east or, you know, north or south, uh, or east or west, I mean, and most of the time we'd park over on the, on the south side and come in from that direction. And when you'd walk in the door, it, there was a big, big rock wall and you would see, there were always like plants and tall things like maybe banana trees or something like that in the in the uh, little garden area or it wasn't a garden area it was just I guess it's an atrium and um, they were always right there when you walked in the door and then there was the um, the elevator if you needed to take the elevator to go up also there was that escalator that everybody wanted to ride up and down the escalator so you had that option too and then well actually when you walked in the door the elevator was off to your to your right and straight ahead was the employee entrance and you just go right if you were a worker you just go right on through that direction and that's where all the stuff took place and go up the escalator and when you would when you would top the escalator on the right was the um, there were restrooms down there and also um, the snack bar was on that side which you know as a kid uh, or as a teenager working there and, and as a younger kid I never really didn't know much about what went on in the snack bar because it it was open only at night after everything else was closed. That was where, like, if the truckers came in and they didn't, they wanted coffee and a, you know, sandwich or something, they'd go up there. Then, if you went to your left, right as you turn, as you turned left, was the cafeteria line, 
and then across the hall was the was the door to go into the kitchen, and then down the hall was the broiler room, which was the big restaurant. And then beyond that were two banquet rooms on just beyond the broiler room, and then um, some more bathrooms down that on the left side, and then at the end of the hallway uh, was the gift shop. And that's where, as a kid, I always wanted that giant lollipop that was about this big around. You know, it was huge, and it sat right in the middle of all of the lollipops, different size lollipops, you know. And I always thought, oh, wow, man, wouldn't that be fun to eat that lollipop? It'd take you two years, but, but, you know, everybody thought that lollipop was something because it was right there. They had all kinds of things that were Oklahoma. Uh, lots of Indian things, uh, Native American. Um, we are Cherokee here in this part of the country. This is our is the nation, and, and my family's Cherokee. And so we would see lots of things. They'd have dolls, they'd have moccasins, they had little um, oh, dress-up outfits and things like that uh, that were Native American. And then, of course, like I said, everything Oklahoma. And so you could get almost anything you wanted, especially if it was a, some kind of a souvenir or whatever from Oklahoma in the gift shop. And then, of course, like I said, you'd have the, the, those lollipops, <laughs> all the candies and things like that the kids always want. And then there were another set of elevator, or excuse me, escalators and an elevator on the, that would be the north end, on the far end there where the, uh, <clears throat> where the um, gift shop was to, if you were on, if you were going westbound, you would park there and then come up those stairs, or come up that escalator or elevators. So, yeah, it was a, it was a fantastic place. It had the, the, you know, the ceilings were very high and, and the rounded, you know, the archway um, was, um, I don't remember what kind of ceiling it was. It was probably a, I don't know, maybe it was a blown concrete or something. And then, um, but the walls were rock and they were beautiful rock walls. I love those walls. I always thought they were so pretty. Um, the floors were tile and um, probably the most fantastic thing about the whole place was the fact that you could watch the traffic from either side. Um, if you were in the Royal Room, uh, you could see the traffic go well, see, see the east side. And then on the west side, there were uh, louvers that were, I'm assuming probably on a timer, I don't really know, but they would turn with the sun so that it wouldn't get so terribly hot in there. It would get hot, believe me, on that side, but it, it would block some of the sun so you didn't get quite, quite as hot. Um, so the louvers, and I'm, I'm sure they were on some sort of a timer. Then there were gas stations below on both sides, and uh, depending on you know, which direction you were going. And then underneath, downstairs, on, on both sides were the workings, you know, within the, the mechanical stuff and the kitchen and, and the storage and the bakery and all kinds of things like that. So it was a pretty fantastic place. I mean, and, and I think it was, for its time, I think it was um, quite an engineering feat. I think, I, I think it was, but I, of course I don't know. But. How were the bathrooms? Bathrooms were just standard bathrooms. Um, they were several stalls, you know, and then a, you know, and then a couple of couple of sinks and mirror, and of course your little little um, sanitary things that you you know little machines. Um, they were um, pretty clean most of the time. Um, Annabelle, Mike, she was pretty good about running a, a tight ship. She kept things going, and you had bathrooms upstairs on both sides, and I think there were bathrooms in the um, gas stations on both sides downstairs too. And then of course the employees had a bathroom downstairs too. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was quite a place. As a child, you know, you mentioned your mom mm -hmm. brought you to her sorority meetings there. <coughs> Did your family take you to eat there at all? We didn't eat out much. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, folks just didn't eat out a lot. They stayed at home a lot. I mean, you <laughs> you would have people over to your house and eat, but um, or you would go to somebody's house, or your grandma's, or aunt's, or somebody. Um, I do remember eating there um, maybe once or twice as a child growing up, but it was a real special occasion to get to go to the glass house and have, have dinner or lunch, you know, because it was, you know, in the broil room. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, people would eat on the cafeteria line. Pe people mostly ate over on the cafeteria line um, on that side that were travelers. Um, they just wanted to get some food and their kids and them and off they go. And uh, so that was, and that was more of a hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, um, salads, you know, jello, pudding, that kind of stuff, drinks, and, and 
that sort of thing. And then the broiler room had, you could get fried shrimp, you could get fried chicken, you'd have steak, you know, roast beef, those kinds of things, and lots of, lots of different you know, things like that. And, and the desserts, I always thought, were fantastic. When I worked in the broiler room, I loved love to, to uh, work the desserts because, you know, what kid doesn't like sweets? <laughs> With your fingers, if you were <laughs> so. so, did you when you were in high school? Did you have any events? Oh yes. At the glass house, we always had the junior senior banquet and prom. Well, the prom wasn't there, but the junior senior banquet was always at the glass house, and it would be on the side where the cafeteria was, um, so that you could they could set up all those tables and have a have a large venue there, set up tables and chairs and. We would have our, our banquet there and um, have a nice meal that was, you know, plated and brought to you. And then we'd have some, I see, what else? We had other things too. What did we have? We'd have, um, sometimes if there were, um, somebody was getting married or somebody was having a baby, there'd be a shower in one of the, in one of the um, banquet rooms. In fact, uh, our wedding reception was out there. And um, there were, yeah, there were there were several events out there. And then I remember <clears throat> my dad flew airplanes, and they would have flying ins because the airport was right next to the glass house. So they would people would land there, and they would have a fly in, and they would all come and have breakfast, and they would have some kind of a you know a sit down breakfast for the guys that would you know bring you know fly in, and um, so they had they had those kinds of events also. And I'm sure there were other events that I didn't know about, but those are ones that come to mind. So you're graduating from high school and eventually you start working at the Glass House? I started working when I was a, right after my sophomore year. Okay, so how did how did you learn about a job opening at the Glass House? My mother and Annabelle were best friends. <laughs> Everybody who wanted to do something different from year to year, uh, when you were in high school, you would you would just know, you know, kids would talk. I mean, kids talk about everything, you know. And then I worked at the glass house last summer, and I'm gonna, you know, there's gonna be some, they're gonna start taking applications here pretty soon. So you rush out there and get your application and fill it out and take it back. And wait for an interview. Wait for a phone call. <clears throat> it was quite an quite an honor to get to work out there. I mean, a lot of kids worked at the grocery stores, the filling stations. Uh, you know, they work at cafes here in town. Work at the movie theater. Um, you know, different things like that, but getting a job at the Glass House always seemed to be, or anyway, in my estimation, getting a job at the Glass House always seemed to be quite the thing. And I got to start there before I was 16, actually. Uh, <coughs> like I said, um, Mother and Annabelle were best friends, so, you know, I got to, I got to start a little early. And um, I worked on the cafeteria line to begin with. Uh, probably the first summer, or the whole summer there. But Annabelle was one of these kind of kind of bosses that if you needed, to, if she needed you somewhere else, she had no qualms whatsoever about. Come here, let's go over here. You're going to do this, that, or whatever. So I really worked all over the place. I worked, I worked with Warren down in the bakery some. I worked in, I worked in the snack bar. Or it's not snack bar, excuse me. I worked over in the gift shop. I worked in the broiler room, in the, in the on the line, in the kitchen. I, I. Uh, Serve parties, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. I can't remember what the event was. It was the year I had graduated from high school or wasn't graduating. It might have been my senior year. I even danced in a go-go cage. <laughs> I don't remember what it was for. It was probably for like a chamber of commerce thing or something. I don't remember. But um, oh yeah. And then I was uh, as a sophomore. I um, I was the entertainment for the. For the uh, junior senior banquet, I did the hula um, on a table of all things. So I'd been to Hawaii when I was a young kid. My grandmother and step granddad lived there, so I spent a summer there and learned to do the hula. So I remember when I came back, I, my mother had me doing the hula all over the I did hula for PTAs and Sunday school classes and sorority meetings, and ultimately for my for my um, for the the junior. I was a sophomore, but for the junior senior banquet so it's quite interesting. <clears throat> Describe the uniforms for Oh my god. <clears throat> the uniforms, if I had to wear one of those today it'd probably kill me because it's like being wrapped up in saran wrap. 
They were a yellow dress that buttoned all the way down. They were polyester fabric, and they had puffy sleeves with a with a um, with a band around them, and um, they were buttoned all the way to your neck. And then there were two buttons on on either side of your shoulders, and there was a white I don't know what it is, um, not really a vest, but something that came down to down down to the to the waist. And then you had a white cotton, um, white cotton um, apron, and then they had this square in the back that you would fold and put a um, make a. I don't remember what the little thing was that you put over it. Was some kind of a. You might have just made a, made a knot in it, but it fanned out, and that was your that was your little thing that you wore on your head. Bobby pinned that to your head, and um, then we all had to wear white shoes and stockings. They were, um, the uniforms were, because it was air conditioned, it wasn't so horrible, but if I had to wear that today, oh, anyway, it was quite an ordeal. But I remember thinking that was a fantastic uniform. Oh my gosh, I got to wear a uniform. And we had, we would get two uniforms at the beginning of, you know, when you started working there. And you would get two full uniforms with your headpiece and your vest and your, and your white apron and your, and your dress. And so you had one that you wore and then one clean for the next day and so you always, you know, you were rotating those. Uh, we would almost always bring two aprons to work with us because you never knew when you were going to spill something on you and you'd have to change that apron. And it was, excuse me, if you got chocolate pudding on it, you had to <laughs> hand off real fit if you didn't change it. So, um, yeah, we always had, had two aprons. And the, um, the, the, the pieces, the, the vest and the apron and the thing that you wore in your hair, had to be starched and ironed because they were 100% cotton. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything. I mean, you'd be standing there because I, I, I went to work at six o'clock in the morning and at five thirty, I might be standing there ironing my apron or something to get it ready so that I, I'd be ready to go to work. But and that was in the day when we didn't have pantyhose. We wore a girdle or a garter and hose, and and you always had to have an extra stocking or two with you because if you ran out, if you ran a stocking, you had to change. So it's a little bit bit different than, and I don't remember what the guys wore because most of the men were worked in the background mm -hmm. and downstairs they didn't they weren't out of you know on display like the girls were when we were in the on the cafeteria there were a couple of guys that worked on the cafeteria line with us uh, but most of them worked <coughs> you know either in maintenance or in the bakery or somewhere like or cooking or washing dishes and um, and then got, of course the guys that worked at the gas station so mm -hmm. Do you remember what you were making? 90 cents an hour and tips. And on an average day, your tips would run? I might make, well, it depend on where you were working, but if you were in the broiler room, you might make, you know, $15 a day, mm -hmm. 10 or 15 bucks a day, because, you know, especially if you got a, you know, you got a big table or two, you know, of, of people, that would be really fantastic. Um, I remember I made enough tips my last year that I worked there that I bought my antique china cabinet that I have now um, and it was five hundred dollars. Wow. And so I had saved all my tips for a year to buy that china cabinet and it's in my it's in my dining room right now with my china in it so I, I bought that right before I got I knew you know my husband and I had been dating since we were juniors he was a junior and I was a sophomore in high school and we so we were you know high school sweethearts and so we knew we were going to be getting married, and so I started saving money and saving th for things like my china cabinet because I, you know, always wanted that china cabinet. And it was an antique. I'd seen it in my aunt's ch um, antique store, and I always wanted it. It's a curved glass piece. It's really wide. It's got three big curved glasses on it. And so yeah, those tips are what what bought me that that china cabinet. So yeah, our tips were very important to us. And back in those days. You really didn't have to report anything like that. You just, you know, you got your, you got your pay, you got your check every two weeks, and then whatever your tips were, those were yours. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have to share them with anybody. You didn't have to turn them in, or I, maybe you were supposed to, but we were never told that we had to turn them in or anything. So, yeah, whatever we got, we got. Well, how did you learn to do the various jobs? How was the training? <clears throat> Annabelle trained everybody. Uh, if she didn't train you, Warren did. And um, you started out, most everybody started out on the cafeteria line because that was the, basically the easiest. 
Um, we had, when you would start the cafeteria line, there was the uh, flat top grill, and then you had the fridge fryer, and then on the other side of that were the refrigerators, and then a door going into the back, and then on the other side was where the drinks were. And then so you would just go down the line, and um, you, would be, you would be taught um, by one of them how to, how to cook the pancakes, how to cook the hamburgers, and you know, how long to cook the french fries, and those sorts of things. And when you, what times you were supposed to start doing certain things, and when you were supposed to quit. And they gave us a general, you had a general idea, the traveling public, um, what times people would start wanting hamburgers versus, uh, versus pancakes. So we would always, you know, kind of adjust to that. And I can always remember um, working on the line and somebody would be in the back, maybe on a smoke break or something, and they would yell, bus! And everybody would just go crazy. And you'd start just cooking up stuff and dishing up things because if a bus came in, you know, that had, you know, 50 people on it, you know, you were just slammed. And, and of course, nothing was in go containers. <clears throat> You had to wash all. <coughs> pardon me. You didn't have to wash the dishes, but you had to bus all the tape. If you had a bus boy, fine. If you didn't, you had to bus the tables and get everything back over to the kitchen so it could be so it could be uh, washed and brought back across again for the line. So um, we were trained. We usually got about two days of training. And I was thinking about this this morning before I came. I thought, you know, I can I can remember everybody that worked on the line with me the first summer. None of us were over 16. Now, how, how many people do you know of that would turn a business over to a bunch of 16-year-olds <laughs> to operate? All of the experienced waitresses and, and people, older people, worked over in the broiler, but we worked on the line, and that was that was the hard work because, well, I mean, standing on your feet as a waitress is hard work. Don't get me wrong, but you know, just standing there flipping burgers and flipping pancakes and doing this and that, and making sure everything was full and you know, it was making sure you had clean dishes and silverware and cups and glasses and things. Coffee was made, you know, all that. It was not easy. It wasn't easy, but it was, you know, it was it was um, interesting to say the least. Taught me a lot about people. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I learned more about people than I did anything. The traveling public. I always told when my when I was teaching business, especially, I tell my kids. If you can satisfy the traveling public, you can satisfy anyone. Because, you know, you're stuck in a car, you got your kids, the dog, grandma, you know, and you're sitting in this car and you're going across country. And, uh, I can remember traveling with my kids, it wasn't easy. And then to stop in a place in a restaurant or somewhere and try to get everybody fed. And you got a bald kid and somebody else is starving to death and two boys that want to fight or whatever, you know, up and down the hall. So it was interesting. Tell me about your experience working in the broiler room. In the broiler room, okay. Well, I finally got to graduate to the broiler room uh, whenever I was um, <clears throat> the summer before my senior year. So that I worked in, on the line two years, and then I went over there. Got to work in the broiler room and became a waitress. And there was a lady over there that I sort of followed around because she seemed to be the one that, that knew how to get things done, and she was... She was really, um, she was a, um, she was really a go-getter, and she knew how to, to, you know, how to talk to people. And I thought being able to talk to people would, would really make a difference. And she was a good waitress. She was always Johnny on the spot with a coffee pot, you know. And she was, um, she didn't take any guff off of people. Her name was Betty Moon, and I don't know how old Betty was. She might have been in her 40s, 30s. I don't know. Of course, I was. 17. I thought she was ancient, but I followed her around and began to learn how to um, how to work a station. And you know, when you're until you've ever been a waitress and you don't really pay attention, you don't realize it. Or I I I, I wouldn't have um, that you have you know certain waitresses have certain stations, and there are always certain stations that are going to be your better stations than others. Uh, because of their um, location. So if you've got if you got a station that had some window seat window tables, then you usually made a little more money. People like to sit over there and they would linger and drink their coffee and have a piece of pie and whatnot. 
uh, learning how to write things down on your on your pad and get it back to the kitchen and how to not forget something that was always the hardest thing you know was trying especially at the beginning was trying to remember how to you know you do their, you do your drinks and then you come back to the salad and the, the meal and the bread and the butter and then the dessert and then the t tickets and oh you know remembering all that and who had what you know when especially when the place is full and trying to remember all that even though you have it written down and most of the time you start with one one person on you know on certain certain spot the table and you work your way around and that's the way you deliver your food then you you know then you can do that but if you for some reason messed up or whatever then you could be in a, in a royal mess or get the wrong food to the wrong people or maybe something wasn't done correctly back in the kitchen and the waitress is always the one who catches it you know from the uh, from the customer so that's kind of something that you had to really work at Annabelle was really good to train our us as waitresses though she um, she made sure that we knew how to set a table, we knew how to put the food down and how to take it up, um, how to walk around with a coffee pot, even if it wasn't your station, if you saw somebody's coffee empty, you poured, you know, you poured coffee no matter what, um, if it was your station or not, and to try to make, their, make your, um, your customers as comfortable as possible um, and get them their food as quickly and hot as possible without, you know, without making it sit and wait for food or you know, whatever whatnot so yeah a waitress is uh, it's uh, it's more than just taking an order and putting food on the table you've got to talk to your customer especially if you're if you want to be good at what you do you, you have to learn how to talk to the people and you know people will ask you lots of things about about the area like do you see any Indians around here or you know things like that back then you know people would ask those kinds of questions or you know, where are all the cowboys? And how do you see? You know, how do they? Where? Where are? What do they do? And and ask you about things like the Grand Lake. You know, because we are so close to the lake, they'd ask us about that. Route 66 wasn't as big a deal back then as it is now, so we didn't get a whole lot of questions about that. Um, mostly about the Indians. Most mm -hmm. of the questions are from people who were traveling through. You know, you you'd get questions like that. But there again, being a waitress is. There's more to it than just taking an order and putting food on the table. Well, what, what type of woman was Annabelle Southern? Annabelle, she was a spitfire. She was about four foot nine or ten, maybe, and um, she was a demanding boss, but not in a way that you were fearful of her or um, worried for your job or anything like that. She when she told you to do something, she expected you to do it and do it the way she wanted it done. And everybody did it. I mean, I don't know of anybody that ever really bucked Annabelle about things because she knew the business so well. Her, um, her mentor was Miss Kellogg. Kellogg was the one that came here. I never did know the woman's first name. I just always called her Kellogg. Um, she came here when the glass house opened and she hired Annabelle to be the manager. Annabelle was working for public service at the time and she was a, I don't know what they call them, they, she would go around and, and demonstrate stoves and things like that, cook, you know, do all that sort of thing. And she was quite the accomplished cook. So she was, uh, she was always, you know, interesting as far as when you would have a, um, a banquet or something like that, you know, she'd always try some new things. And, Different ways of, of serving things, but when she was when she was training you, she expected you to stand there and listen to everything she said and retain it. And if you but if you had any kind of a problem or if you had any kind of an issue with a customer or or another employee, you had no qualms about going to Annabelle about it because she was she was there to listen to you and to take your your concerns to heart. Um, Outside the glass house, she was a fun person, a very fun person. She, between she and my mother and my grandmother, they taught me to cook almost anything in the world and not be afraid of cooking it. I can remember going to places with Annabelle uh, and mother, and <laughs> we would be in a restaurant eating pie and coffee or something, and she would pick up a coffee pot and just walk around the room with it. <laughs> and start filling cups. You need some coffee? And she poured your coffee for you. 
Uh, but she was she was quite a character. She was very well known around this area. Um, she was in she was an interesting person. Had lots of lots of uh, background, having been you know in a lot of different places and lived in a lot of different places. Um, she was fun to travel with. Whenever I was grown and married and had kids, and I was in the sorority that Mother and Annabelle belonged to. I went with Annabelle and her sister Catherine and her two nieces and another friend from Elk City and we went to Hawaii for two weeks and um, she was fun to travel with. She, you did your feet at the floor every morning and you were off and going and doing things and looking and seeing and you know interesting you know learning about interesting people and interesting things and, and you went all day long and when Time to go to bed. You were in bed because you knew your feet were going to hit the floor at daylight the next morning. So she was a she was a hard traveler and a hard worker. She was not afraid to do anything that she asked you to do. She would do anything that she asked you to do. And, um, and she was very fair. She was a very fair woman. I never had any any problems with. Of course, like I said, I've, I've known her all my life, so she liked working for my parents almost. But I always knew if I screwed up at work, she'd be the first one to call my mother and tell her. So I never did. Well, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> no, never. I never bucked her with anything. I, you know, she said to do it, I did. Because I knew she had a reason for doing what she did. Now, some people will tell you to do things and you go, I wonder why they want that, you know. But Annabelle would always tell you why you were doing something the way you were doing it. Um, she was really good to, to give you lots of information. Like I said, she'd tell you and she'd expect you to retain that. And I know the first couple of banquets that I worked um, in, in the ballrooms, um, you know, she would tell us what she wanted us to do. You had a certain job to do, and you were expected to go do it. That was it. And um, I did in banquets. I did prep work in the kitchen. I played the piano for a lot of different banquets that were, you know, for like cocktail hour, you know, I'd play the piano played some music for him, uh, or if we had um, some kind of, somebody that was going to come and sing or something, she'd always tell me I needed to play this because they were going to sing, and, and um, then I'd work the, you know, work the room, excuse me, work the room, set the, set the tables, do the, do the serving, and I mean, we all did that, so it wasn't anything as me in particular. Mm -hmm. We all did those kinds of things, so. Do you recall any notable folks passing through? Uh, Colonel Sanders. We would be told that there were people coming or going, or oh, you just missed so and so, you know, because you weren't there, uh, or if you were working on the other end, you might not see them. But um, we had uh, we played host to governors and and you know people you know in the um, politics and that sort of thing. We had all I mean, if they had meetings or something, they would be at the glass house mostly because that was one of the locations where it was kind of centrally located place where everybody could. Would come. People would fly in, you know, we'd see people fly in, but we wouldn't be able to get to the airport to see them. We were working and we'd just be looking out the windows and watching them. Um, so we had, uh, yeah, we had notable people, but I, the only one I really remember was Colonel Sanders. And he had the white suit and the white beard and mustache and white hair. Did he order the fried chicken? I don't remember. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I thought that several times. I thought, what do I remember? That he, I don't remember what he ordered. And I, he wasn't at my station, so I don't. I think actually I was actually across the across the hall and on the cafeteria line at that time. We just got to go peek around the corner and watch. When you would take a break, what would you do? Well, when we had our breaks, which were not too often, you know, you get a couple of breaks during the day and then your lunch. Uh, we would go in the back. When I was on the line, you'd go in the back and you'd go get a coke or whatever and sit down back there and, and rest. And uh, if you needed to change your apron or whatever, or go fix your makeup or your hair or something, you know, you'd go off to the bathroom, you'd go. Um, of course, we didn't have cell phones or anything like that, so, you know, we'd sit and talk to each other. We'd visit with each other, and, and we all smoked back in the day, you know, everybody was a smoker, so you would sit back there and smoke. We had one fellow that worked on the line with us who was quite the practical joker. And we, I can remember one particular, I don't remember what the situation was, but one time he, he unscrewed the lids of the salt and pepper shakers, just barely put them on, so when you tipped your salt shaker over, 
your food to dry your salt. I remember another time when uh, I was actually on break, and all of a sudden I heard this horrible crash, bing, bang, boom, whatever, and one of the other girls had taken a tray of, of um, dishes across the hall to the kitchen for dishwashing, and opened the door and went in and slipped on some water and fell down, and dishes just went everywhere all up. So there was our break. We had to go help clean the mess up. But you know those things kind of those kind of things happen. So, but we just would hang out in the back and joke and laugh and and sometimes we'd go down to the uh, to the gift shop or I might go downstairs into uh, the bakery and watch. Especially if we were getting ready for a wedding and Warren would be decorating a cake and I'd go down and watch him decorate cakes sometimes. So I enjoyed I enjoyed that. So I'd go down and see what what was going on. run the place, you know, but it was, it was fun to kind of watch. And, and I, you know, I worked pretty much all over that place, so I knew, I knew what it took to run the whole thing. I mean, a lot of people just went in and worked their shift and left, and they didn't really have any idea about what was going on behind the scenes. But I got to work in a lot of the things. I got to work everywhere except the snack bar, because I never worked that late at night. But, um, yeah, I, I saw the whole thing from beginning to finish so <clears throat> did you have any interactions with the Conoco guys oh yeah we knew them all mm -hmm. they the boys that worked in, in the filling station down there were kids that went to school with us mm -hmm. and the Conoco uh, guy <clears throat> the guy that ran the stations was a fellow here in town and his sons worked there and and we knew them and then um, like I said the boys that worked in the, in the filling station part they were they were kids that went to school with us so we knew we knew them always visit with them on our way in or out because we have to cross you know cross over the, the uh, driveways to get to our cars so <clears throat> any any workers uh, come to mind that you remember fondly Warren of course Warren Fetter he was the he was Annabelle's right-hand man and she depended on him a lot to to do a lot of things so he and he was very good at, at doing what he knew he knew her inside and out, so he knew exactly what was what was going on. Um, the kids that I worked with over on the line, um, Sheila, Ro Miller, Sally Pope, Pam Hartley, Jean Kidd, um, you know, those were people that we we all worked together. I mean, we were quite the, the team over there. And um, then over on the cafeteria, I mean, excuse me, in the broiler room, uh, Vera, uh, who Williams now is the name, and um, Betty Moon two of the waitresses. Are, well, actually, Vera was, she was a waitress, but she was the hostess also. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Mrs. Reed was a hostess there, too. So we had, we had a lot. And then back in the kitchen, um, oh, what is her name? I can't remember her name. A little short black woman. I don't remember what her name is right now. But she was, she was a character, too. And then Big John, John Oglesby, he was, uh, he, he took care of all the dishes. He was the dish man. You know, if, if you had anything you were afraid of, you could go get John because he's a big guy. <laughs> big Osage Indian, he wasn't afraid of anything. So, yeah, we had a lot of people that, that we were, we all knew each other. You know, yeah, this is a small town, and almost everybody that worked there was from Benita or, or the surrounding area. How many summers did you work there? 65, 66, 67. Worked there in the summers, and then when I graduated, I worked there on weekends when I would come home from school, and I also worked um, parties and, and banquets. A lot of us would stay on for not during the, we wouldn't work at the glass house during our weekends or stuff when we were in high school, but if they had special special things, they might call us in to come in and work a, work a party or something, so I did those. So I worked there for three summers, and then the weekends and holidays and things uh, that first year after I got out of high school. When's the last time you've you've been back? Well, right before it closed, we went out there, and uh, then of course when it was McDonald's, we were out there several times. And then, oh shoot, we went out there and had had lunch a month or so ago, I guess, to get a subway. Um, after the remodel. After the remodel, and it's just 
it, it's kind of heartbreaking to see what all they've done to it. I mean, I know everything now is a big open concept, and that's the popular thing, but it just kind of looks like a big old warehouse now, <clears throat> unfortunately. Got a lot of fond memories of it, though. <clears throat> well, married, have kids? Yes, grandkids. Uh, married my high school sweetheart. We had two daughters, and um, then we, they, one of them, well, one's married, divorced, the other one's married, has been married for a long time, and she has eight children. And I have, uh, I have two grown, well, I have four grown grandkids, but two that are grown and married now. And uh, they, uh, they, all the kids that have come, when my grandkids come, we always go to the glass house to eat a hamburger or something like that and tell the stories. And, you know, back when Grandma worked there. And Stephanie, my daughter that was the mother of all these kids, um, she actually worked there when McDonald's opened, when they, when, it, when they changed it, it just became a McDonald's. She was one of the first um, employees there, so she worked there too. Mm -hmm. For, I don't know, maybe a summer or something like that. But yeah, we always take the kids back to the classroom so they can see what, they, what, what it was, but of course it's nothing like it used to be. But. Well, you're a lifelong Vanita resident. Yes. How has uh, Vanita changed through the years? A lot and not at all. Uh, it's it's really hard to say. Uh, <clears throat> downtown has really gone to sleep <laughs> and, and is in a long, 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 long sleep, I think. I'm hoping that at some point in time some of the businesses will come back. Um, we've had several that have opened and closed and opened and closed, but um, it's just not what the way it used to be, but you know the way we shop now is so different than the way we shopped, you know, in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, it's it's hard to see that a lot of that might come back, might not. Um, so we've had a lot of change there, and a lot of things, you know, have moved out uh, on the edges of town. People are more apt to get in their cars and drive to another to a, like Joplin or Tulsa to shop because it's, there's more, you know, there's more variety and, and um, it, it kind of makes me sad that people will go out of town and buy things like cars, you know, and things like that when we have perfectly good car dealers here and you know, they think they're going to get a better deal and they're really not. And if you, you know, the way I look at it is if I need my car worked on and I bought a car out of town, I have to go out of town. If I you know, buy a car here in town, I can just call one of the guys and say, hey, come fix my car, come get my car, whatever. And, or tires, or, you know, things like that. Um, so those kinds of things have changed. Um, the, we still are a, a, a pretty close-knit community when it comes to things like uh, civic groups. They're still important mm -hmm. to the community. Um, the churches, all obviously, are very important to our community. Um, my husband and I and another couple have been, were the founders of the Peaceful Animal Adoption Shelter, which is a new, a new um, animal shelter here, which, you know, years ago people would never have thought of an animal shelter, but we do, we do have that now, and um, um, so we're, you know, people are, for the most part, are, are into helping animals as well as, as humans. Um, <clears throat> Homes in Vanita have remained about the same. Um, I mean, of course, you know, there's always going to be new homes built, but um, as far as people living in single-family homes, that's pretty, still pretty much that way. Now, we, my husband and I do have um, some apartments and some townhomes that we have some people living in, obviously. Um, but for the most part, most people live in, in single-family structures. They work here. We don't have a huge um, industrial park, but we do have a few businesses here. A lot of people will work in, you know, in other towns nearby and uh, drive to work at that, which I think is, I, I wouldn't want to do, but I did it for a while because I taught in Ketchum, but that was you know, 15 miles. So it's not like I'm going to drive to Tulsa every day to go to work or somewhere like that, but yeah, we, that's, so that kind of thing has changed. Um, 
the, the face of the business world has changed in Bonita. Uh, the school districts, <coughs> excuse me, the school system, it seems to be that we haven't really grown. Um, there were 97 kids in my graduating class, and there probably were 90 kids in the graduating class last year. So as far as the size of the district has gone, we probably haven't changed a lot, which kind of gives you an idea about the size of the community. We'd still ride around 6,000. Um, a lot of people live out in the country, you know, rather than living in town. They wanted a few acres out so they could have a horse or a couple of cows or something. Um, so then a lot of people live outside of town, but, but you know, for the most part, we've got you know, everybody living in Benita. And um, we still are a farming and ranching community. That's, you know, mainly what we have. Um, we do have um, the Home of Hope, which is a, a, a facility for developmentally challenged adults. And so there are a lot of, I'm not say a lot, but several homes around town that have modified for, for those residents and they live in there in, in those homes with their caregivers. Mm -hmm. So we have we have quite a few quite a few of those. Back in the day we had Eastern State Hospital, which was called, you know, Vanita, you must live in the nut house. You know, that was always a joke. Uh, that closed as far as the mental health facility and reopened as a um, minimum security prison. And a lot of people work out there. And I don't really know how many how many uh, inmates there are, so uh, but it is minimum security, so they come and go. You know, we don't have them out here for long periods of time. So that's uh, another large employer that we have. So, yeah. Lots of changes through the years. Lots of changes. Lots of changes. Well, as we we start to wind down, what's What's one thing you want to make sure you definitely tell us about your memories of working at the Glass House? The fact that people, no matter what station in life they're in, they all are pretty much the same. <coughs> I don't care if you're a senator or if you're a if you're a dishwasher. Uh, when you come into a restaurant and you sit down, you expect the same things. You expect to be treated with respect, and um, your service to be prompt and pleasant, and the food to be good. And that's something that I remember that I was that was instilled in me from Annabelle. Be nice to your customers. You know, be good to them. They've they've been working hard, traveling. Uh, your truckers that come in, you know, they're they're driving that big old truck and they're hot or cold, and you know, they're tired and they want a cup of coffee or you know whatever. Be nice to them. Uh, always be nice to people. Uh, that's you know, you might be having a hard day. Maybe you know, maybe somebody cussed you out or, or made you feel like you were about two inches tall. But you've got to learn how to blow that off and move on to the next customer that comes in. And, and I think just learning how to uh, be a good person is one of the things that really sticks in my mind about what I learned from working there. Tony, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so I much. I think it is too. Thank you. We, I appreciate it. We appreciate you sharing your memories of the glass house with, with us. And I've got a lot more, but I know we've got to go. So. <laughs>